Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at Medford United Methodist Church. My name is Joe Monahan, and on behalf of myself, our associate pastor, Rachel Callender, and the entire staff and congregation here, we want to say thank you uh, for choosing to be with us in worship this morning. We hope that it's a blessing to you. A couple things as we begin this morning and uh, as we're getting started. Hope first that you'll take some time to share the stream, let people know where you worship. Also, uh, be sure to let us know that you've been here. So visit our attendance log at medfordumc.org slash online dash attendance. And especially if you're visiting with us, uh, maybe for the first time, if you'll share your contact information, we'd love to uh, put you on our mailing list and let you know about things that are going on here at the church. Also, uh, we do hope that you'll make a gift uh, to help support our ministry. And so you can do that a couple different ways. Uh, you can do that through our app. Uh, Medford UMC NJ, and you'll find that uh, either on the Android or the Apple uh, App Store. You can also uh, visit our website at medfordumc.org slash give, and you can find it. Uh, that is a real easy way to make a donation as well. So a couple things. Uh, next Sunday, we're looking forward to our first uh, outdoor worship service, and so that's going to be happening on September the 27th at 930. It will also be live streamed. If you want to attend in person, a couple of things. So we're going to be gathered out in front of the church uh, by the Boker Hall ramp and by the porch there. And so that's where we're going to be. Uh, so you'll have to find some other place to park in the parking lot. Make sure that you bring uh, your own chair and also make sure that you're wearing your mask. And so as you come, uh, we'll have things uh, set up and lined out so that uh, you can be uh, distanced from your neighbors. I do want to make sure that you understand we want everybody to sign up in advance for this event. And you can do that at medfordumc.org slash in person, all one word, in person. And uh, you'll find a link there with information, procedures, and also uh, the ability for you to record who's going to be coming with you so that we can make a plan uh, to welcome you on next Sunday at 9.30. And we look forward to doing that. So uh, today's topic, we're still in this series about... Uh, finding forgiveness for ourselves. And so today's topic is one that's important, I think, for a lot of people. We're going to be talking about shame and what that's about, what it means, and um, really how to let go of that shame and how God allows us to let go of that shame uh, to be able to move on to something that's greater. And so as we begin this morning, I hope that you'll take a moment and uh, just center yourself, take a deep breath, and let's join together in this prayer. Will you pray with me? God of compassion, forgiveness, and love, you sent Jesus to walk among us. We thank you that he came to release us from the prisons of fear, guilt, and shame that we have built up around ourselves. Today, help us to break those bonds and grasp his offer of new life. Help us to take hold of his promise of a fresh start. Let us live into the promise of the resurrection, knowing that we are your children, entirely forgiven and beloved. Amen. The splendor of the King Clothed in Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. You wrap yourself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at your voice, trembles at your voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will sing how great, how great is our God. In age to age you stand, and time is in your hand. Beginning. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, 
sun, the lion and the lamb, lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great. Good morning, friends. Congratulations, you just finished your first full week of school. Some of you are learning on a hybrid schedule this year. Some of you are learning at home every day. And I bet there's even a few of you out there who are going into school five days a week. But no matter how you are learning, it sure does look different this year. Even your workspace at home looks different. I have some examples of workspaces of our friends from church. Abby and Timmy have a great one set up in their dining room. Mrs. Lombardi set up her classroom in her dining room. And Johnny and JP have new desks in their workspace. People have always had to adapt to the changing world and learn in different styles throughout history. One way that people learned was by going to church. In the 1200s, many adults did not know how to read. They relied on the church leaders to tell them stories about the Bible. Churches in countries like England and France have, are grand cathedrals. They're very big, and they have beautiful stained glass windows that tell the stories of the Bible. Stories like the Gospels, historical events, and the Old Testament. Here are some examples of stained glass windows from a cathedral in France. There are 176 windows in this cathedral, but the ones that I am showing you here are the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus' life, and among other stories. Even our church has beautiful stained glass windows. They don't really tell a story, but they are still very beautiful. Eventually, people became more educated and started learning through different ways, like going to school. And just as you have adapted to learning a new style, people in the past have always adapted to the changing styles of education and learning. You are all doing a great job so far with school. The adults in your life are very, very proud of you. I am really proud of you. 
You are all a great example and an inspiration to show us how amazing and strong and flexible children can be in this ever-changing world and in such an unusual time. So keep up the great work and know that God loves you and God sees how strong you are. So have a wonderful week and have a really great school year. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 from the Common English Bible. One day Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowd, he said to Simon, row out further into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked all night and caught nothing, but because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather once again. Even if it's virtual, uh, we look forward to being together in person next week. But in the meantime, Lord, we give you thanks for the technology that brings us together and just give you thanks for the scriptures that have brought your church together uh, for thousands of years. And we just pray that as we think together about uh, these words and what they mean for us, that you might uh, bless us with your presence, that you might fill us with your spirit and give us a new insight into what you're saying through them to us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you about the worst sermon I ever preached. So it was an Easter Sunday. It was 2002. I was still in seminary. And uh, I was working for a pastor who liked me and trusted me. And the deal that we had reached about Easter was that I would preach the early service. And he seemed genuinely happy about that. In fact, he was happy enough that he invited a whole bunch of his friends to come. And at one point during breakfast, I'm pretty sure that I overheard um, them talking among themselves. And I heard him bragging a little bit on me. And um, I don't know what he said exactly. It was something like, you know, today from, you're going to hear from my intern, Joe. And he's, he's been doing a great job. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be a great message. Well, that semester, I remember taking this pastoral care course, and I was very much in the mindset of how to care for people. And I uh, imagine that many of you know and very are very familiar with the scripture text that we usually read on Easter Sunday morning, which is from John 20. And the way that it goes is Mary Magdalene is going to the tomb, and then he uh, she finds it empty, and so she goes back to find a uh, John and Peter and get them before she returns to the tomb then. Uh, and she's outside the tomb. She's weeping. And um, before the risen Jesus appears, she's there all by herself while the men have actually gone and left her. They've gone and left her alone. And that is the detail that I chose to base my entire sermon on. Not the resurrection, not life, not hope, but the fact that Peter and John left Mary weeping outside the tomb. I was about a third of the way through this sermon when I realized this is not going well, like at all. I looked out and everybody's just like, what is this? There's nobody who looks happy and it is Easter Sunday morning. Now, maybe today, if 
I felt like I was bombing that badly. I would drop everything and just stop and pivot and try to do something else. But back then, I did not know how. So I just went on. And it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. It was actually the most hopeless sermon that you can imagine on what's supposed to be the most hopeful day of the year. It was a complete failure. I felt absolutely awful afterward. I'd let my senior pastor down. I'd let myself down. I'd let Jesus down, actually. And it doesn't feel much worse than that. And to this day, every time I go to preach on Easter, it, honestly, every time I go to preach on Christmas, I think about that sermon. I read my message and I reread it over and over and over again. And even when I think that it's okay, in the back of my mind, I still wonder, is this going to be a repeat of that Easter Sunday? Because you know what? I thought for sure that that one was pretty good too. What I experience whenever I remember that incident is this very profound feeling of shame. If we're going to talk about forgiving yourself, there's no way to avoid talking about shame. Shame is a powerful emotion. Some researchers say maybe even more intense than either love or fear. And it can keep us trapped in our past by controlling our responses in the present. Shame is that voice in your head that says, you're no good. That voice does so many harmful things to us. It robs us of our self-esteem. It keeps us from being able to let go of our mistakes. It prevents us from being able to take any risks. And it gets in the way of opening up and being vulnerable with people. That voice is typically rooted in a memory of failing, of maybe disappointing someone that you care about, of being humiliated or making a fool of yourself in some way. Now, shame is a different thing than guilt, which is based on a concrete action, something that you messed up. What guilt says to us is, I did something bad. I did something bad. But shame is different. What shame says is, I am bad. Guilt always points us to an action, but shame always points at the core of who we are. And then causes us to question who we are. Which brings us to the scripture. Peter's response to the miraculous catch of fish is actually pretty surprising, at least to me. You would expect him to be like, Jesus, thanks. Or like, dude, that's amazing. How'd you do that? And instead, all he can say is, leave me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Do you think Peter feels shame much? He's just witnessed perhaps the most amazing thing ever, the most compelling bit of evidence uh, for God that his eyes have ever seen. And his reaction is not to celebrate, not to be in awe or wonder or amazement. His reaction instead is to ponder all the ways in which his life has gone completely wrong, all the ways in which he has failed to measure up. Peter is pretty well convinced that if Jesus really is a prophet who's been sent from God, this prophet has absolutely no business hanging out with fishermen from Galilee. I'm fascinated by how precisely this story parallels what we know about what, how, how shame works in our lives. And you see in Peter's response the way in which shame isolates us. When we're feeling like Peter feels, we're absolutely certain of one thing, that we're no good for anybody. And so we just want to be by ourselves because it feels like we'll do less damage that way. Have you ever said this to anyone? Just leave me alone. We say that why? We say that because we don't want to have to run the risk of screwing anything up or hurting anyone. If no one else is relying on us, then it's impossible to let anyone down, right? 
And so in that way, shame is this profoundly isolating emotion. So there's an, a scholar, a speaker, and an author. Her name is Brene Brown, and she's a, an expert on the subject of shame. And she says in this classic TED Talk that you probably have seen, it's from several years ago, she talks about shame as thriving on three things, secrecy, silence, and judgment. So how do we manage to keep the most shameful things about ourselves secret so that they can continue to be shameful? Well, we self-isolate. We keep our shame hidden by refusing to let anyone in. And we do that because we're frightened that if anyone gets too close to us and sees the real us, then they'll run away. And so the tragedy of shame is that it feeds on itself by isolating us further and drives us deeper into secrecy. And the longer we keep a secret, the longer that we try to hide, the scarier whatever it is that we're hiding tends to become. And that's where Peter is at. He's terrified that if Jesus gets close enough, then Jesus will see Peter for who he really is and that he's going to run away screaming. But Peter, being Peter, does something amazing here. Even though he has no idea what he's doing, he gets something exactly right. Actually, two things exactly right. This man gives hope to all of us who know that sometimes we're far more lucky than we are smart. And what I mean is this. Peter understands intuitively that the way out of his shame is to actually say something about it. And that's what Brene Brown would tell us too, that the antidote to shame is vulnerability, our willingness to share something of ourselves. What finally robs shame of its power is our willingness to talk about those things that hurt and frighten us the most, to talk about our deep wounds, our regrets, the things that we say to ourselves, I should never have done that. I've told that story about my worst sermon uh, to preaching classes before. You know, I felt kind of an obligation to tell it in those settings. But as far as I can remember, I've never told it as part of a sermon in one of my churches. And now I might wonder, actually, you know, every year on Easter Sunday, so long as I'm preaching here, will someone think about that story? But that doesn't matter because somehow you have to get your power back. A secret can control you only so long as it remains a secret. You get your power back when you talk about the things that you are afraid to talk about. And Peter seems in a moment to grasp that truth. And so he confesses to Jesus, I'm a sinful man. Now, I said that he gets two things right. And the first one is to speak his shame out loud. That's the first thing he gets right. But the second thing that he gets right is to choose very carefully where and with whom he speaks about his shame. Because breaking your silence is not quite enough. When you tell your story, that story has to be met with empathy. Because that moment of sharing is a dangerous one. If your confession is met with empathy, you'll start down the path to healing. But if it's not, if instead your sharing is met with judgment, it'll only make the wound deeper and more painful. So let me ask you, what do you think happened next with Peter? Can't you imagine Jesus responding, my friend, why do you say that? Why do you say I'm a sinful man? And then you can rest assured that everything Peter poured out in prayer to Jesus after that was met not with dismissal or condescension or judgment, but instead with grace and forgiveness and support. When we're wrestling with shame, we need to go to the places in our lives where we are sure to find empathy, whether that's with our spouse, whether that's with someone who's uh, part of our family, whether that's with one of our closest friends, 
whether that's with a counselor or a pastor. We just need to find it somewhere. Now, I know that that's not always easy. There are some times in our lives when we just feel like we don't have safe spaces to bring what it is that we're feeling. But what that point should drive home for us is the responsibility we bear for creating those spaces for the people that we care about. That's how we witness to God's unconditional love for us. When someone is in that moment of vulnerability, opening up to us about their shame, about how they've been hurt, about how they've hurt others, we hold this tremendous power in our hands. We can either steer that person towards healing by listening with empathy and understanding, or we can do more harm by shutting ourselves off and responding with judgment rather than grace. And we hold that power in our hands. That power has been given to us by God. And the question is, how are we going to use it? Because shame is a powerful force in our lives. And our ability to overcome it determines everything about how deeply we'll go in our relationships with others and with God. Peter was ready to chase Jesus away in order to keep his secrets. But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he heard Peter's failures and still challenged him to undertake the greatest mission of his life, the greatest mission in the history of the world, to leave the lake behind and instead to go out and fish for people. So if we're going to continue carrying on Jesus' mission, we need to learn not only to overcome our shame, but to be the kind of people, the kind of places, the kind of spaces where people can experience the healing that happens when vulnerability is met with empathy. Now, Jesus did this for Peter. And so what I'd ask, what I'd say, what I'd wonder is, what would happen if we were able to do that for each other? Let's take a moment. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the gift of vulnerability. We thank you for the gift of empathy. God, we thank you even today for the gift of shame, which drives us into your arms, if we'll let it, which allows us to open ourselves up to each other, which allows us to find the healing that we need. Lord, we pray that we might find spaces in our lives where we can share the things that have hurt us the most, the things that we most regret, the things that we think are the most unforgivable, and that when we open up, that what we have to say might be met with empathy and love and compassion and forgiveness, just as you would meet it. We pray that we might be able to do the same for others. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who always always, always greets us with nothing but empathy and compassion and love. Amen. Friends, lately here at the church, we've been talking a lot about the idea of fitness. Um, it's important, especially during the pandemic. Many of us have uh, kind of fallen off our routines. Maybe we're not doing all the things that we used to do. Uh, maybe sitting around more, maybe eating more, maybe not exercising as much as we did. And so we've been talking about ways to get people moving. And uh, as a way to care for our bodies, uh, the bodies that God has given us, it's an important thing. And so uh, you may have seen that uh, we're going to be talking about some pickleball here on the campus that came out in the weekly email. But the United Methodist Women had their own idea, and they had the idea for a concept of what they call a move-a-thon, and they're calling it the Push Your Tush Move-a-thon, and it's going to be taking place during the month of October, and uh, really it's a brilliant idea. So a move-a-thon is a little bit different than a walk-a-thon or a bike-a-thon or whatever in that you can decide what activity appeals to you. And so that might be walking, it might be running, it might be biking or swimming or whatever. Whatever it is that appeals to you, you can do as part of this challenge. And so the deal is, uh, it's not just uh, an opportunity to move, but it's also an opportunity for us to challenge one another. It's an opportunity to raise some funds, and all the funds that we raise are going to go uh, to what's called the Pastor's Discretionary Fund, 
which is the fund that we use uh, to help people who are in need here locally in our uh, Medford area. And so we're really excited about this. There's a great website that's been set up for it where you can uh, sponsor people, you can sign up yourself, you can get more information. You can also put out challenges and uh, have people sponsor you to participate in a challenge, kind of like, I, you know, will you uh, support me if I will bike three miles or whatever it is. So if uh, you'd like to get in on that, our website is going to be at push your tush, all one word, push your tush dot Medford UMC dot org. And so when you go there, you'll find information about the event and you can sign up for it. Again, it's taking place during the month of October and uh, we're going to keep lifting this up and I hope that you'll participate. We want to thank you for all of the gifts and all of the ways that you make a difference in the world and your gifts uh, to support our ministry help us to keep doing what it is that we do uh, week by week, supporting you spiritually um, and taking care of your, your family and the people around you in terms of uh, the prayers and the presence that we're able to offer um, as a church. And so I thank you so much for all of your support. You can make a gift to the church at our website, medfordumc.org give. You can give through our app. You can give by text. Uh, send the word Medford Give, all one word, to 77977. Or you can mail us a donation at 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. We thank you so much for your support and God bless you.
So I thank you all for joining us today on the call. And uh, so with us today, we have Jackie Dougherty and uh, Tish Cornu, who have been uh, leaders in our parishal ministry. And I'm just really grateful for their work. I'm really grateful for the ways in which this ministry continues to uh, show the love of Jesus uh, to people who are inside the church and outside the church, just as a reminder of the fact that uh, we are praying people. And um, I'm just really grateful for the way that this, um, that these prayer shawls have touched lives, uh, including my own. And so uh, we're going to take a minute and we're going to pray. Uh, one of the prayer shawls that we're going to be dedicating is for uh, Barb Malinowski, and that's um, Jackie's husband's um, uh, cousin. Uh, is that right? First cousin, yeah. First cousin. And so uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, we lift her up in prayer. So we pray today for Barbara. And the others uh, were praying uh, in advance of being able to share them because we want to have some that are ready to go. So if you are, or somebody that you know is in need of prayer uh, and would be touched by one of these shawls, please let us know and we'll make sure that we get them to you. Uh, so reach out to us in the office or reach out to Tish or to Jackie and we'll uh, be sure to do that. So I'm gonna turn over to, uh, to Rachel and just uh, give her the opportunity to say a blessing over these shawls. We each have a couple with us and uh, so let's take a moment, let's pray together now. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you for um, all the work that goes into these prayer shawls, the uh, each stitch being uh, a prayer and a thanksgiving to you. We ask that you be with each person who receives a prayer shawl, that it be a source of comfort, a source of love, a source of hope, um, and really a way that they see your presence in action during really tough times in life. Holy God, we, we ask that you continue to, to bless this work and, um, and continually to feed this community through this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And I want to thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Tish. And thanks to everybody who participates in this ministry and um, for all the work that you do. These are somewhere around the 520th uh, shawls that are going out into the world uh, from this well, It's our pleasure. It is our pleasure, truly. We're Absolutely. grateful for you. And Absolutely. it means a lot. And it's right. a lot to, to me as well. All right. Well, have a good day.
friends, as you go forth from this place, go forth to be people who are willing to speak out of your shame, to break its silence and therefore its power. Be willing to share. Be willing to share in the places where you know you can find empathy. And then be willing to offer that same listening ear and that same empathy to someone else so that they too might find the healing that Jesus provides. Go forth in the name, the power, and the grace of Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen.